Okay, it's time to get going on section 10D, which is about um, angular momentum. And we'll begin with this, a review of what we have uh, covered so far in chapter 10. <clears throat> uh, what we've been through is uh, kinematics, dynamics, Kinetic energy, I showed you this before we started. And now we're to angular momentum. <clears throat> so here's that chart we had uh, for a long time now where we've got the linear compared to the linear defined, the angular defined, the relationship between them, including that centripetal linear one that doesn't really have an angular uh, version because it's assumed that it's all held together for that. We're now adding two more columns. Uh, one are forces, which become torques, and momentum. So the force uh, we've done before is now called a torque, and they're related by the distance perpendicular, or the radius perpendicular of the force, the other way around, uh, RF sine uh, phi. Momentum, <clears throat> linear case we know, uh, it's I omega for angular variables, and there are two relations for the conversion. Uh, the capital L, which is I omega, is also RP sine phi if you have a point particle. The problem is, if you don't have a point particle, then this RP sine theta doesn't mean very much because R goes to where, right? Goes to the center of mass, that's the point, right? So you only really have this RP sine theta or RP sine phi is typically when, when you have uh, a point particle. So outside of that, you just have I omega. You don't really have such a hard connection, but what we're gonna do with it is the same. It's gonna come up when you have collisions or things happening abruptly that you don't wanna talk about too much. So that there is that point particle part. And uh, while we're at it, let's sort of review everything else we did with the angles. We had our angular equations, use the same kinematic ones as the, uh, uh, use the same way as the linear kinematic. The second law we did is I alpha for the torque. And once we get angular momentum, uh, delta L over delta T, delta angular momentum over delta T, is the torque, just like delta P over delta T is the net force. All those little R's we stick in and take out all uh, work their way out. It's the same equation for conservation of energy, except we add this rotation part. <clears throat> and then angular momentum conservation is run just like it is for the regular momentum, where you have uh, I1, I2, omega1 plus I2 omega2 initial is the same final. There is, however, cases that pop up in rotational angular con uh, conservation that are a little bit different. You might get an I1 omega1 initially is equal to I1 omega1 final. And you say, well, how can that be without the same omegas? And the answer is the moment of inertia can change. And that often is the big part of the problem. And we'll do some problems like that with moment of inertia actually changes. And then you get something that looks like this one on the bottom. Okay, so here we are with conservation of momentum. <clears throat> if you have two objects, they look like this. Uh, you add them up, the same as you did for the linear. If you have one object whose moment of inertia changes, you use that one. And of course, you can also define sort of an angular impulse, as it were, uh, to get um, uh, when you have just a single object you're looking at, the same as we had for the, um, <clears throat> for the case uh, of the uh, linear stuff. Okay, so now we have a, uh, a problem to work out. <clears throat> Person sitting in a stool that rotates freely, so that means no friction losses. 
And that's good. Initially has arms stretched out with a five kilogram mass in each hand and the stool is rotating. The person pulls the masses close to his body. What will happen to the person's angular speed? Okay, so we have sort of, we're interested in uh, one person plus masses. We're going to treat these as a single object and uh, so if we look at the initial case here and the final, uh, initially you have uh, the person here uh, just got um, their arms stretched out holding these weights. And, and the stool is rotating, right? So they're going around and pulls the masses closer to, to his body. Right now we've got to get this one. They're tucked in now close to the axis. And so if we're going to do the moment of inertia, well, it doesn't have to be initial, but I can write it down. That's equal to the I of the person plus uh, two times uh, mass of the weight, uh, distance to the weight squared, where that's the distance of the weight there. And I'll put a little initial on this because down here, the same thing true is final is I person plus two mass of the weight, R the weight final squared. And this is smaller. So uh, this tells us that I decreases. Now our physics over here, because it's one object, uh, we will <clears throat> write I omega initial is equal to I omega final. And so uh, we can solve this for the angular speed omega final is equal to uh, I initial omega initial and then we have to divide by this I final. And because I decreases that means this number here is bigger than one, the IF over um, uh, <clears throat> this is bigger than one since we make the denominator smaller. <clears throat> and so if that's bigger than one, then omega F is greater than omega I and it will increase. Now, uh, this sounds like something that's pretty reasonable, but uh, what I want to do is to show you that this, in fact, uh, happens. So here we have a movie of someone on a stool with two white dumbbells, and this, there's an axle down here at the bottom. If we play this movie towards you, I want you to watch really closely the speed. Now, it's not a great video because it's not quite going fast enough. <clears throat> but he starts off, uh, when he puts his arms out, you can see that he slows down much slower and then moves in, and moves in, they're going faster. It's not a great demo. So what I'll do is I will um, uh, go ahead and, and show you a couple other things to, uh, to make this a little bit more convincing other cases. Okay, so here we have another demonstration set up, show, a setup <clears throat> that shows you that as I change the radius, uh, the, um, uh, the um, <clears throat> speed is going to have to get higher because we're going to have momentum conservation, uh, angular momentum conservation. So if we start something up here, starts going around in a circle here, and it seems to go faster and faster as it's going down into the hole. Right? You can almost hear it better than you can see it because where this video is chunked off. But what exactly is going on here? And the answer to that question is, uh, is uh, <clears throat> well, we've got angular momentum 
of our uh, of our um, trying to find something to write on here that the camera can see it because <clears throat> I can try probably mess up our focus. But let's come over here. So we have here a um, <clears throat> coin and it travels down on a, uh, uh, well, down a cone, right? Looks like this. <clears throat> so it travels on a, let's call it a track that gets narrower. And it goes around faster. So if we were to take a picture of the track from the top here, we're at a certain point. It's got a radius that's here. Remember the radius goes to the center of mass of the coin. And that's R. And so I is equal to at any point, the mass of the coin times r squared. And so since we're looking at just one thing, we have i initial omega initial is equal to i final omega final. And so um, <clears throat> the uh, if i goes down, so i is decreasing, So that means I final is less than I omega, so omega final must be increasing. And that's basically what we see here. Now, in order for this to work, we're using momentum conservation, uh, L equals I omega conservation. And that works when there's no external torques. So there are no external torques in the system and uh, <clears throat> uh, so that, um, uh, well, where the torque come from, right? It's pushing against the normal surface, that's normal, so that's radial, so that's not going to give any torque because it's towards the axis it's spinning about, which is the middle vertical axis of this thing. Uh, friction, right, it's just static friction when you're rolling, so no, no energy loss to friction. People say no friction, that's because no energy loss to friction. There really is static friction holding that tire on. Um, and the, um, <clears throat> what this predicts is that omega should increase. So if we, if we uh, look at this, omega, <clears throat> if we uh, plug everything in here, you have uh, m r one squared omega one is equal to m r two squared omega two. So omega one over omega two goes as uh, r two over r one squared. And so the frequency is per second, uh, cycles per second or revolutions per second is also going to scale as this number squared. So if we get half the radius, then because this is one, two, two, one, then it's uh, four times the um, uh, frequency. Now we may instead be interested in V tangential, right? So if we uh, pull a V tangential out of this, you get m r one v tangential one is equal to m uh, r two v tangential two, and so then you get the v tangential one over v tangential two is equal to uh, again it's r two over the top over r one to the first power. So if you actually look at the linear speed of coin. That only goes up as sort of half radius is twice the speed. And so let's take a look at this. Uh, this is the good thing about having a, uh, a 
See, there's the instructions. <clears throat> this is a good thing about having uh, uh, this on video. Unlike the demonstrations you, you get in, uh, in class, you can run this one back in slow motion. So we'll start one down, and then we'll wait until it gets down a ways, and we'll start another one. And you can look and see when the radiuses are twice far apart to see if you're, which, which way it's really doing what it's supposed to do. So if you look at two consecutive frames of the video, then you can look at how much it moved between the frames. That's getting V tangential speed, right? Delta X over delta T. Or if you just look at how long it takes to go around, you can get uh, the, um, a look at the four times the frequency. And so let's just send this one more down for fun. And uh, now some of you might say, wait a minute, you told me that there's no work being done here. <clears throat> and so if there's no work being done, then energy should be conserved. But if the thing is speeding up and tangential, I know a half mv squared is the next. And half mv squared is ke is increasing. Right? Something is doing work. Because work net is equal to delta ke, right? which we keep reviewing because, well, we need to. And so if something is doing work, what is doing work? Think of it for a minute. Okay, that was your minute. Uh, you can pause the video if you need more time. <clears throat> uh, it's potential energy gravity, right? It goes down. Now, if you think about it, if the coin is not to fall over, right? The, the coin is sitting here balanced on this edge, right? That's our coin. Coin's center of mass is here. And if, if uh, Ke isn't gained uh, correctly to match uh, the um, this, then the coin will fall down or fall up. And depending on which way it goes, it could fall upwards, it could fall downwards, whether the center center mass falls too fast or falls not fast enough, the coin drives up from underneath it. Uh, so what does this mean? It means that the shape matters. So this overall shape of this thing that looks like this, that is to get the kinetic energy. This shape right here changes the radius at just the right rate as it falls down so that we have both kinetic energy and momentum conserved. Otherwise, your coin falls down. So whoever designed this, they understood physics. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And so uh, that, um, uh, that's kind of important for us here uh, to know that, well, gee, physics is important in important things like toys. OK, back to uh, the real world again. And. Uh, this is uh, similar to the problem we just saw. In fact, it's just about identical, except where that one was qualitative and this one we're, we're putting in uh, exactly how far the way they go. Uh, we get the moment of inertia of the person and we've got the, where the masses are. And so we're gonna solve this out and get a number at the end. So we'll start with our initial cases. By the way, this uh, stool is rotating at once every second. This tells us, by the way, omega 
initial is one revolution per second, which of course isn't um, isn't a uh, this should be in radians per second. So we have to go with uh, two pi radians per uh, revolution, and this gives us two pi radians per second. That's omega initial. We now need i initial, we need i final, and uh, we can uh, go ahead and calculate this. So our initial, we have i the person, uh, i person equals um, um, 4.7 kilogram meters squared. And for the final, it's the same. Uh, for the masses, it's equal to, uh, these are considered point masses. They're five kilograms each. First is two of them. And that's, that's the number of masses there. Uh, and of course, we're going to need is a, is a point mass is mr squared here. And so the mass is five kilograms. And r is 0 0.75 squared. Uh, and that's kilogram well, it's in meters squared, I guess. And this turns out to be um, uh, some number that um, we'll, we'll deal with later. Over here, it's changed. It's now two times uh, five kilogram and 0.15 squared meters squared. So it's changed. Uh, and omega initial is equal to uh, 2 pi radians per second. And omega final, we have to get from uh, our physics. So again, we're talking about momentum conservation because it rotates freely. So, uh, L conserved, so L initial is equal to L final, uh, I initial omega initial is equal to I final omega final, and we plug in the I initial, and this is um, I masses initial, and this is I masses final, and so um, this is I person plus I masses initial. Omega initial is equal to I person plus I masses final, omega final. We divide both sides by this and we solve for omega final, right? We have the person here, we have the masses there, there, just put into the calculator uh, for initial and final. <clears throat> We've got this, you plug in and you get um, omega final is equal to 2.1 uh, rotations per second, where I uh, converted back radians to rotations, just because uh, that's what it started in. I figured that was a good way to have the answer. Now, the interesting here is just like we did with our, our vortex machine over there, it's interesting to compare uh, Ke initial, which is, of course, one half I mass initial plus i person omega initial squared to ke 
final is one half i mass final plus i person didn't change omega final squared and what you find is the kinetic energy has changed so my question again to you is what did the work And the answer, of course, is the person. You have to pull right there. Person pulls. You actually have to pull them close to your body. The person is doing work, positive work. So KE final turns out to be bigger than Because the person did positive work, it's positive change in kinetic energy. You can calculate what it is from this rather simply, and I hope some of you are interested enough to uh, actually go ahead and do that. Okay, so um, let's uh, take a look at this. It's a sphere that can change shape, it's called a Hoberman sphere. It's his initial radius of R. Now these are these things that sort of grow up and shrink as you throw them in the air. <clears throat> so his initial radius of R and angular speed one, radius decreases to half R. What is the new omega? <clears throat> yeah, you are supposed to neglect friction, air resistance, and any person that might be throwing it, it's away from the person, it's not involved. So all this stuff tells us, okay, L initial is equal to L final. That's our starting point. Uh, I initial omega initial is equal to I final omega final. And for a, um, for a hollow sphere like this, the moment of inertia um, so I for hollow sphere <clears throat> uh, is equal to 0.7 mr squared. And notice that the mass uh, is the same. The radius changes. And so when we writing it down over here, we get um, uh, 0.7 uh, times the mass times uh, our initial squared omega initial is equal to 0.7 times the mass our final squared omega final. Get a few handy cancellations, 0.7 in the mass, both get cancelled out. And one can write down uh, that omega final is equal to r initial over r final squared times omega initial. Uh, and so omega initial is just omega. And its radius decreases, so r final is equal to one half r, r initial is equal to r. So plugging these things in, omega final is equal to r over uh, r divided by two squared omega. Okay, the r's cancel, the two on the bottom and the bottom is two on the top is four omega and four omega is this one. Uh, and so uh, you might say, what did the work here? And this little spring inside the Hoban sphere that makes it grow as you throw it. And that is, um, or go or shrink, or whatever. And that's uh, what, gives us any change of energy that you might calculate. 
uh, because we are always concerned about energy being conserved when it's supposed to be. Uh, and that's, if you look at the spheres, you'll notice there's a little spring in there that allows things like that to happen. Okay, so this is here. We've got one more. A uh, person is sitting with a, um, on a stool that's free to rotate. Uh, it's handing, handed a rotating bicycle wheel. It's initially rotating at this. The person remains motionless, flips the wheel upside down. Uh, and we want to know their new angular speed. So uh, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> uh, it's clear that the free to rotate part means that L initial is equal to L final. So we'll start with that down here. L initial is equal to L final. <clears throat> and the, um, uh, we've got to add up what's going on here, right? So the wheel here, I wheel is about equal to MR squared because most of the mass is out where the tire is there. There's very little in the spokes and the axle. Uh, so um, that turns out to be uh, uh, See where is it? Half um, it's a half a meter radius, and this. So if you sort of put that together, you get um, five times a half squared is five fourths kilogram meter squareds. That's the eye of the wheel, <clears throat> and the moment of inertia of the person's stool. Okay, so if we set this up here, um, we get. Um, Uh, let's see, the person flips the wheel upside down. So our initial is the person holding the wheel and the final, so the, like this picture. So initial is there's the wheel and there's the person. And this is sort of, that's up. And the final is the person's behind, there's the wheel and it's now down. So the um, L, of the wheel changes sign. Right. Um, so <clears throat> we're initially starting with zero. So uh, the initial case here. Uh, Let's say that um, L person equals zero, omega initial equals zero. L wheel initial uh, is equal to I wheel omega initial which is the 250 radians per second. And for the final case, you have them both moving together. So you have um, I person plus I wheel uh, at omega final. <clears throat> Okay, so if we set these two equal to each other, you get um, I wheel um, um, <clears throat> a ton, and this is a, a negative here. Well, one of them is negative, right? Um, I'll make it negative because uh, we'll call that negative. I know it says up, but okay, if this is initial, 
and this is final, we'll call that negative and we'll call this plus. The reason why is, well, why not? So a negative uh, I wheel uh, times omega initial is equal to I Pearson plus I wheel omega final. <clears throat> so if we solve this now, you find that uh, you're getting, when you flip this over, uh, you get the angular momentum and person starts rotating and I um, omega final is equal to minus 133 radians per second. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. So let me just go back because you didn't tell me that it was off screen. Now you're usually pretty good at that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, initially we had uh, no angular momentum into the person because they're sitting without rotating omega zero. But the wheel had an initial angular momentum, which we're going to call uh, negative. We're just going to say it rotates, so it's negative. It depends on which way omega is, right? And so initially it's negative, and then at the end, flip, flipped over, so it's positive. And so uh, well, that means omega final is going to end up being in the, in the positive direction. And uh, we um, add it up through our standard mountain conservation and we get this, um, this is L initial is equal to L final, which I've written about three times on this piece of paper now. You can only see twice, unless I fill it down and see it in red. So uh, that means you can start spinning. So that sounds like something that's worth seeing a demonstration for which of course means I have one. Okay, so here we have a demonstration, uh, another one of these in the... Passing the wheel, demonstration of the conservation of angular momentum. So first the wheel gets its initial angular momentum and it's handed to Dr. Haywood, who organized it for this. He turns it over, he starts spinning and hands it back, he's still spinning turned over again so he'll get the same direction, he spins faster. Each time he does this, he gets a little bit more angular momentum as he takes it from the wheel as he turns the wheel over and you get that, um, that change. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there's of course other ways one can get a similar result to this uh, and that would be through uh, uh, where is this? That would be through um, uh, and so you have to find the right one here. Through um, uh, yeah, here we are. <clears throat> through a method such as this, where instead of somebody handing it, you simply take a, a mass and a spring, you start giving that mass angular momentum. Well, if you give mass angular momentum and you're free to rotate, then that means you're uh, going to have to have angular momentum in the other direction, so the net angular momentum is still zero. So when he stopped that mass, notice how he stopped. That's because the net angular momentum, in fact, has to be zero uh, before and after, right? If you stop before and everything stops at the end, better be, uh, oh, and you stopped spinning the mass, then of course it better be stopped again. So I've got, uh, I believe, uh, one more here. And if you just bear with me while I'm finding it, then uh, let's go over to it. Let's see, we did the, um, seem to be um, in the, uh, there we go. This will bring us to the right one. Um, so if we do one more example, <clears throat> here, another way of doing it, you give it some angular momentum. As you turn it, you start spinning, go down, you stop, turn it the other way, you move that way, you turn it, you go back. 
This is when you don't have somebody to hand you the other wheel. Uh, of course, you can calculate all these things, I should hope. <clears throat> and uh, one more of them, but this one is somewhat different than the ones we've been doing because uh, we've been talking now about sort of change in just uh, one dimension. And here is a change in two dimensional. So how many of you here remember, or there, I should probably say, how many of you there remember orbit? And orbit is basically an object that's going around in constant speed around the planet. And the force of the planet gives you the centripetal acceleration to stay in a constant orbit. And the reason why that worked is that our acceleration is perpendicular to our speed. So now think, what would that correspond to in the world of rotations? That would mean that we get a torque that is perpendicular to our uh, angular momentum, right? The angular momentum is like velocity, it's times mass, but it's basically the same. Uh, if we had a torque perpendicular to that, then we'd, we'd orbit, we'd orbit, right? And so if you think of hanging a bicycle wheel off the end of its axle, what is it gonna do? It's gonna try to fall down, right? That's a torque. And the direction of that torque is along the torque's axis. And suppose it's already rotating perpendicular to that. We'll take a look at this video. <clears throat> It's called the bicycle wheel gyro because gyroscopes are based on it. So first you get some angular momentum. You put it down here. Now it really wants to fall down, but it can't fall down because the torque to make it fall down is perpendicular and you end off orbiting. That's called precession. And precession is uh, in fact, well, that's how I, gyroscope operates, you can tell when somebody's trying to turn you because you don't. Uh, but it's a nice way of going ahead and, uh, <clears throat> and showing you something that really looks weird that that bicycle just doesn't fall down. But the reason why it's weird is exactly the same as why things can orbit the Earth. Roughly the same if you look just in the horizontal dimension, you swing a weight around at the end of a string. Uh, what that weight's doing, if you ignore the gravity pulling its down part, just the part going in, it's basically doing the same thing as this here. You're applying force perpendicular and the momentum it has sort of keeps it doing what it was but circling rather than, uh, you know, running straight towards you in the middle and hitting you. And so with that, that is the end of 10D. And now we're going to make a big jump up to 16 before we come back to 11 near the end of the class.